Good morning. We are, we are here for the open conversation on open, uh, open system for computing. I have Jeff from Active State with me, the CTO of Active State. I'll let him introduce himself, and then I have a couple of panelists, Tim Lane and Clint Finley. Alex Williams and Aaron will join us later. Jeff. Hi. Um, as I said, Jeff Hobbs uh, work at Active State as CTO, and we work in the uh, cloud space with uh, private PaaS solution as well as focusing on um, you know, dynamic languages and, and editors. So very much focused on the uh, developer side of the cloud. So uh, uh, you, you have built a PaaS on top of your phone the platform, right? Correct. So uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit about it? And also you recently announced Active to Sakato uh, 2.0. And uh, yesterday you made another announcement regarding your ID. So if you can briefly talk about it. Yeah, we have um, uh, we've been working in, in a private PaaS solution for uh, a few years. When Cloud Foundry came out from VMware and the open source announcement that they made, we looked at that as something that uh, would possibly be quite interesting to build on top of. Within a day, we realized, yep, this has a good framework in it. Okay. So how does how does this platform uh, platform differ from the one you had before? And uh, yeah. where did you change from your time? So we, had, um, we had a few uh, key tenants in what we were trying to build. One, um, a couple of years ago, we thought that we wanted to do a lot. We've always been focused on across all the dynamic languages. Komodo, our IDE, supports them all really well. And, and we were realizing that there's, OK, there was a Ruby option out there. Google had a kind of a Python, and then they did add Java later, but it's still pretty restricted. Um, so we wanted Polyglot, but we also wanted it to be private paths. So it's much in the same way that Heroku or Google App Engine operate, except it can be deployed wherever. Mm -hmm. So that was what we were you know, building. The Cloud Foundry had a very interesting um, infrastructure layer mm -hmm. for how you want to build the, a, a PaaS solution. It kind of decentralized. You had these roles combining easily new services and new languages. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we also liked about it is that adding Java can make this a lot of Java background at VMware. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, but all the other languages could be equally supported well. They came out with something that was, I think it was originally Java, Node, Ruby, and that was, that was it. Um, you added, and you are, you are, you are, so we're responsible and contribute back to Python. And uh, I think like Apple, Apple, and PHP, Apple and PHP, and, uh, and uh, yeah. So then uh, the Iron Foundry is yeah. the, the .NET solution from G3, mm -hmm. and um, that's I mean that's one of the nice things about the open source aspect is others could contribute. The uh, framework of, of the, the architecture of Cloud Foundry was such that. It was easy to be plugging these things in without people. Actually, that, 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 that's what that we did about the mm -hmm. uh, The way you could plug in any language or anything, uh, any language you want. Uh, it's pretty different. And and the good thing for us, you know, being based on Cloud Foundry, even though we, you know, we written a lot of stuff that may be more secure and everything underneath, we're still able to take one of the Iron Foundry DEAs and attach it to a Staccato instance mm -hmm. just in a similar way that they've attached to any other Cloud Foundry instance, and it will just work. So you can deploy to the .NET applications in Staccato. Okay. Anybody else uh, has any questions before we talk about their announcement? OK, let's briefly talk about uh, the announcements you make. Staccato 2.0, what, what are the new features, and then uh, the yesterday's announcement, so that then we will go into the more general topic of uh, open source and cloud computing. Yeah, so um, Stato 2.0 was like uh, last week, I think it's a bit of a blur now, uh, and the, the key features in that were um, much uh, easier cluster based administration. So uh, Stato does have a web console built on top of it, and just 2.0, you can see all the nodes that are attached actually configure the nodes and um, get the, the concept of head node configuration into the PaaS layer. Um, in addition, the support for uh, the Iron Foundry .NET is the key parts that need to be in Staccato are already baked in. So all you need is to have a, your Iron Foundry .NET running, point it at Staccato, and 
Okay, yeah, if, I, if I'm going to the question, I was wondering, uh, thinking about uh, using cloud foundry for talk now. Uh, uh, where would I go to the instead of saying Well, um, in, in, uh, I, I believe that, you know, what, what he's offering is just raw cloud foundry and, uh, and then the .NET component on top. With Staccato, there's, there's quite a bit of difference from Core Cloud Foundry now. Um, at the, the base layer, there's a secure containerization using Linux containers. Mm -hmm. There's an entire web console, a um, uh, rewritten client that doesn't have any you know, other dependencies, so you can much more easily work from you know, Windows, Linux, and, and Mac without having to download and hope that your Ruby installation is the same. Um, there's uh, a, a Again, more focus on security also through the entire uh, development layer. Um, more languages are supported, um, have a persistent uh, and secure file system as well. Uh, and, you know, there's a few other sort of minor issues in okay. there. Okay. So, uh, I, I think we both need to discuss about this when we make the uh, tuning structure conference. But uh, can you uh, uh, just for the sake of the audience who, who are viewing now or who are viewing later uh, in the recording, can you tell the difference between the advantages of security you are having with the uh, LXC kind of uh, cont uh, container based uh, approach uh, compared to with the uh, virtual machine approach from VMware and other uh, virtual machines? Well, the, the VMware one is uh, currently, when it came out, it, it was just basically using Unix users, and then there's secure mode, there's randomized Unix users, all on kind of using the same system. Uh, they're playing around with something called Warden, which is not fully integrated in the system yet, but you can try and get it working, which is pretty similar to what uh, the core staccato uh, secure approaches. And what we're doing, though, is specifically using LXC <coughs> So that, you know, it's basically a pair of virtualization on top of your regular VM. So if you have a DEA, the, that's the execution node, it may have a 8 gigs of uh, memory space to work with, but that will be sliced and diced into different LXC instances. So each person thinks they're the only user running on it, on that system. And in Staccato uh, 2, we're also running, uh, based off of Ubuntu 12, we're using LXC with App Armor profiles for you know, uh, in, enhanced security. So, other panelists, if you have any questions, you can uh, ask about ask now. Otherwise, we can uh, go to the gen more general topic of open source and, and cloud computing. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, Clint. Do you have any questions? No. Uh, okay, well, can I uh, ask a question? Yeah. I'll jump in. I guess um, you, you know, you've already said that there's a, some big differences between what you're doing in Cloud Foundry. So I guess the question is, um, given that some have likened VMware to the evil empire, at, what, at which point, uh, well, question, how much risk is there in, in what, Cloud, what VMware's intentions are with Cloud Foundry? And at which point does it all kind of blow apart and get forked left, right, and center? Okay, so you're asking, uh, you're saying that uh, VMware uh, could do uh, is it uh, evil empire and uh, how, are you gonna, how are you going to fork it? That's the question, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, uh, the, the future of Cloud Foundry is always something that we have to take into consideration, given some of the rumors in the news just in the last week. Yeah. Um, and nobody quite knows what's going to go uh, on next. Mm -hmm. So with Cloud Foundry, though, I mean, it, from day one, it's open source. Until now, it's still open source. Mm -hmm. We can see how they're developing it. Um, the, the rate at which development's occurring is not, uh, you know, any faster than we can always keep up. So we're constantly merging back in changes. Um, you know, with the, with the latest release, there was yet another merge with the added router and mm -hmm. some other pieces. Now, we've already essentially forked it uh, yeah. with some of our changes, and there's a lot of enhancements on top, but there's also some uh, rewritten components underneath. And, you know, the one of the good things about the Cloud Foundry architecture is it actually makes it easy to sort of, oh, I'm going to drop out this Rails component, I'm going to put a Node component instead. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're certainly concerned, I know that, that others are, about, you know, the, the that it, it is a very restricted controlled development process mm -hmm. um, by VMware, but the, we're not 
overly concerned because the whole system is, is open now, is designed cleanly enough to be separable when you need to rewrite certain pieces. Yeah. So I actually agree, like the design, like design, uh, design for the user for the analytic platform, we are for the app code and for the DLP, everybody has forced the platform to come up with their own content. Forking the software is easy because of the open source license, but forking the community is the tough part. Unless it has a community, and take the community away from uh, VMware, it's any fork is practically meaningless. It's going to, uh, unless you are, you have to develop your own community after that. So, uh, who, do you, who, who do you think is in a good position to fork down for the community if VMware ever tries to sort of make it uh, proprietary or is it in a direction to the community? Yeah, Active State certainly has no problem with uh, taking that role if, if it were to go down that path. Um, because you know, we've long history working with open source and working with many communities. Uh, we have a very strong community ourselves. You know, we still get hundreds of thousands of downloads of our software um, every month. So it's it's something that we already have our own community. Um, yeah. You know, somewhere near a million people in our single sign-on system. So there's a lot of people that are interacting with Active State all the time. And of course, we're very developer-focused, um, and and that's that's always been kind of that's the heritage. Uh, whether that developer is an open source developer or maybe an open source developer in the enterprise. Um, so you know, we, we could do that. We already have our own community, which is why Staccato is become something of a success. We get a lot of feedback on it. Um, but we still are actually, you know, we watch the Cloud Foundry community. We'll occasionally uh, help with the, you know, when, when the answers relate to something that is getting answered by anybody else. Um, and, uh, you know, right now it, it is kind of an open question, you know, what, what does happen next? So uh, let's take a hypothetical. I don't know if you know, it's worth the time because they understand the value of Cloud Foundry. But this is a very solution of the community that's in the same time. Do you expect a single company to be able to do input in the community? Or do you expect all the other sort of like app calls or activities to call it a sort of activity? Coming together and forming a new situation, let's say a project in the open stack, and keeping it going? Well, um, it, it, it's it's hard to say because one uh, is it, I wouldn't put it outside the realm of possibility for a large company to screw up an open source project. Mm -hmm. We've seen that happen mm -hmm. time and again. And uh, in, in VMware's case, though, there is that open question. I mean, this week they're already talking about splitting it out. That's very true because if, if a company splits out and all of a sudden has to, you know, you're you're now an open source company. After Either they better have a lot of funding to start with, or it might all of a sudden, oh, it's now open core, yeah. right? And we yeah. saw that with Eucalyptus, who, you, you know, it went open source, then they went open core. That didn't work out too well for them, and then they had to go back open source. Um, so in, in terms of who, who would step up, I would think that you would want at least that a loose uh, federation of of people to all be working together on the same things. Otherwise, you can get a full fracture of mm -hmm. the, the setup, and that probably is not going to be healthy for a long term. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me let me just add uh, uh, Jonathan to the conversation. And, uh, it's already there. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, any other topic that you guys want to discuss? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. uh, let's take a uh, uh, talk about uh, how uh, Cloudflare is going to fit with the uh, different infrastructure uh, layers, open stack, cloud stack. I know this um, is is building some uh, wash components to fit Cloudflare on top of uh, open, uh, open stack. So do you, uh, do you expect to see cloud uh, someone uh, putting Cloudflare to cloud stack and maybe Cloudflare another uh, platform? What is your strategy going forward? Let's say the private pass is taking off in a big way that you expect. Uh, you, uh, the underlying infrastructure layer might be different from what 
different uh, with every organization. So we may want to solve it across multiple peripheral platforms. So what do you expect to do? Well, uh, that's, that's exactly what my talk this afternoon is about, but um, we already do have support for multiple uh, private infrastructure because <coughs> with our focus being private platform as a service, uh, we had to address the needs of the many different enterprises. And we started off with, well, okay, we'll pick off EC2 because it's easy for us to you know what sandbox in there. Mm -hmm. PSphere because they're the current market leader. And then we'll pick one other and have to pick open mm -hmm. And then, you know, immediately some big enterprise comes along and says, hey, I like the product, but uh, we're on CloudStat. So uh, what, what, what's happening here? And, you know, we, we learned over time that, okay, we built it out. So now we support KVM, then CloudStat, OpenStack, you know, the for both the lower hypervisor layers as well as uh, the higher layer. <coughs> um, and that's, nat that's what naturally is going to have to happen with the, the Bosch side, which is really sort of the orchestration part of the cloud mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um And it may not be you know, VMware for whatever reason. Obviously, they're, they're currently very focused just on the, the, uh, the VMware technologies. And, you know, maybe OpenStack because it's kind of got the mind share. But someone else will come in, and provide the cloud stack layer, and uh, and give a pull request, and, and hopefully that would be accepted right in. Okay. Um, you know, it is it is very interesting, especially when you find out that anytime someone installs OpenStack, it's not the same. Yeah. Uh, in across different organizations, so the the, the the subtleties of how you have to manage these things for any level of uh, setup is is. Um, yeah, I open it. And uh, go, going forward, like uh, open source is sort of commodity. And uh, the platform layer, cloud uh, layer, especially cloud foundry is commodity. Layer, with so many people jumping in with the uh, by using cloud foundry as the uh, framework. Uh, going forward, two years from now, where will uh, companies like Active State and uh, TSP and AppWork are going to differentiate? Uh, what is going to uh, what is going to fetch you money, uh, money so that uh, your investors are happy? Well, I think that um, it, it's easy because we're already in separate spaces and separate spaces that have large potential each themselves. So Tier 3 is, is primarily uh, an ISP. I mean, I don't know all about their each of these other business models, but currently they're, they're an ISP. They can provide you that cloud. They can manage that cloud for you. I mean, they run the data center. That's their business. That's what they're familiar with. Um, AppFog, I mean, it's a startup. They're, uh, they were PHP Fog. Now they're AppFog and trying to add more uh, languages. But it's a public pass. They're trying to compete with you know, Heroku or .cloud. And they'll differentiate themselves in, in ways that public passes would be seen as different. So you are, you are, you're you're arguing this essentially like uh, uh, the differentiation is either hosted by offering or private offering. Yeah, and yeah. There, there will be people that are, are fully willing to go to a hosted offering. Um, but, uh, yeah, but at the same time, like uh, cloud foundry being an open source software without any licensing restrictions. Uh, fact, uh, uh, and send it as a private pass, and uh, DLT will do the same. In fact, uh, if my understanding is correct, uh, one of the uh, biggest customers, they went with DLT because the clients, the cloud foundry is the underlying framework, and they, they could anytime bundle it and take it uh, in house. So if if, they, if, all, if all boss players after DLT and others hosted the all those host, uh, hosted by offerings on cloud foundry. If they see by a value, monetary value on the private pass side, they are going to. Uh, and that makes the assumption, assumption that a you know a data center managed services company can make a product software. I think the issue here. I think the issue here is that you're right to say that the opportunity is big enough for all the different players, but I don't really agree that all the different players are in a different space because this is so nascent that the reality is is that everyone's moving so fast on this stuff that you're completely right, Chris. You know, Tier Three, App Fog, could could all do the same thing. So I don't. I, I don't think that it's shaken down enough to actually say anyone's in any one particular space at this point in time. Mm. 
Sure, the, it's uh, you, you could easily view it as, as there's overlap and, and you could potentially cross in the private paths if you want it. But again, is the, the the company TEA the DNA of each of those going to be the right one to have success there? Um, I'm not really concerned. I'm not really concerned about any cloud foundry installation. Okay. So if someone's done a cloud foundry install and then they've done staccato, they I, I prefer them to suffer with do-it-yourself cloud foundry so that they can see the night and day difference to staccato. Okay. Um, and you know, with tier three, we were working. We work with a lot of people that they're they're playing and targeting cloud foundry for uh, different kind of company reasons. Um, and was working with one that had something hosted in Tier 3. So while we were chatting with them, I used one of the typical, oh, I'm pretty sure that there's, there's many holes in a standard Cloud Foundry install. So I, without you know any other real permission except for knowing what their API endpoint, I created a user on their system and um, you know could have pushed up apps and stuff like that. And said, I said nicely to them, yeah, you should make sure you talk to Tier 3 about uh, how to close down the setup. So in that sense, so the Cloud Foundry doesn't bother me anyway. I mean, it, I, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great framework to start with, but people have to learn that it's just a start. So if I put it that bluntly, uh, you are already the tactics, are you confident about uh, what is the can do because you're going to emphasize on security and tell them that you want to secure installation of the OS. Yeah. So that's going to be your... Uh, that's just, that's the biggest differentiator, but uh, the user use is also a major factor. I mean, just the whole web management console and everything like that. You get the, a nice view of the system, and um, and that, that gives you a little also a lot more comfort about what's going on when when you need to you know. So uh, I think we have uh, time for one last question. So uh, there's a criticism that passes with the adoption of passes pretty slow and. Uh, it's not the uh, uh, pass is not going to be the so it's going to be So do you agree to the criticism? And uh, if not, like, uh, where do you think pass is going to be? Um, I think uh, I think your infrastructure is useless without pass on top of it. So um, there's there will always be you know a need to just draw eyes. I mean, vir the virtualization aspect of the cloud. That, that, that's but um, for developers who use this has system and, and realize the ease of use that it represents to them, uh, they're, they're sold in 90% of developers when they've done that. Like, oh, that really is nice and effective. So there will be more uh, demand on their own IT services. Look, if you're not going to let me go off to a public has system, Give me something locally, um, and you know we've heard that directly from IT that, that come to us and say, "Look, we're getting some pressure. You know, we do have 10,000 applications, and we'd rather not have to, you know, help them manage every single setup, right? With PADS, you can go from kind of weeks for, okay, here you've got your red tape for approval and the uh, setup of the system, and oh, you wanted this kind of database, oh, we forgot about the web server that you needed." And to a pass where, okay, here's your memory space on the pre-configured system. Go ahead and push your your up in minutes. Okay. So, uh, anybody else has any, any other question? I think, I mean, in terms of that um, pass adoption, I think, um, that, that, I mean, we all bemoan the fact that pass adoption hasn't been as, as quick as we'd like it to be. I think the reasons for that is pass is just even though PASS removes complexity from developers' lives, PASS is a more complex thing to understand. I mean, it's pretty easy to understand storage or compute. It's a lot more difficult to understand you know, platform as a service. And so I think the reality is, is it's going to take a long time till people, people really understand it. And I think what will happen is, so for example, this morning I talked with Barton George from Dell about their project Sputnik, which is an Ubuntu laptop, and that's really, you know, that's really for me the, the beachhead for them starting to speak to developers. So it's only when you see a company like Dell doing something like Sputnik, acquiring a pass player as they will reasonably soon, tying it in with infrastructure. Okay, now to invite the next guy who's joining online. I'll just see you around probably the next conference. Yep. That's <laughs> <laughs> it. Thanks, thanks for your time. Thanks,
So, Ken, uh, what is your take on PaaS? And PaaS is the future of call services. Well, I think it's something that um, you know, where we at Much more complex to understand. No, I just think I just think there's a lot of moving parts. I mean, I think it's got to be assembled in the way that really speaks to people and really truly makes their life easier. I mean, Pass has to deliver on the original promise that it's going to make my, my life easier and be plug and play, or mm -hmm. you know, it can't be a whole lot of new work for me in a whole new way. Otherwise, I'm going to walk away from it. It's, you know, or not entirely, but mm -hmm. that but specific. You know, I'm going to abandon whatever was put on my plate. So it's got to really speak to me. It's got to be something that, that actually is a building block in my life and lets me step to that next level. Otherwise, I'm going to keep stumbling, and we're going to see it drag out over years and years here, I think, before we get there. So I especially agree with that in the enterprise, because I, they're not going to use a public pass right off. They're going to play with something and 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 the most streamlined environments are all the public pass offerings. You try to put it in a private environment, you deal with all your own unique, you know, derived problems, really. So it's, it's not a one click install. It's not simple to get it into the workflow. Um, and some, some companies I, I've talked to, like I'll show them, look how easy it is. And they're like, well, that's pretty much what we have with a build server and something else. You know, it's, it's, it's not taking them a huge step, and those are usually more developed group groups. So what they, so what they see is, oh, we, we have, have to then deploy it, and that takes a lot of effort. So I think when it, when it gets easier to get deployed into various environments, we'll probably see up to 10. Yeah, and with the API, it's something that is, you know, the enterprise, they get a lot of from the enterprise about working in open or public API space, and you have to have these successes. They see it, and then they want to implement it, and then they want to bring it with firewall, right. and you similar with task packages or just modules or bundles or whatever it is, is you're going to have to be not fully in public, but they're going to have to see that are going to be and then they're going to be able to that. And the challenge is managing all of that in the same way that, you know, we've got, we, or we need an instratus because people want lots of different sorts of infrastructure in different places. So too, when we get to that point where people are trying things publicly, privately, different, you know, different passes, we're going to need the same sort of single pane of glass. Have any of you guys seen any successes in, in past yet? Um, there's a lot of good Heroku stories, and I mean Heroku's really talking up the Facebook app thing, which is kind of um, it's kind of good because there's lots of them. It's kind of a shame because they're always really lightweight and stuff. But um, you know, like I, I'm, you know, I spend a lot of time talking with a development house back home, and they're doing a, a bunch of stuff on Heroku um, and having huge success. You know, great scaling. They forget about the servers. The, the whole promise of PaaS is kind of embodied there. I think the Cloud Foundry stuff, my readers, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a few years younger, so there aren't those great case studies yet. I don't know. Okay. But um, have you heard of any enterprise story from uh, hosted PaaS providers? <coughs> hosted PaaS as in privately? No, like a Heroku. Heroku engine yard kind of hosted PaaS providers. Have you heard of any ent uh, big enterprise story like uh, uh, some of the things we are hearing on the private pass? Yeah, I mean, so um, I mean, at, at DeployCon, there were definitely people there that were were, were doing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So mo most of the enterprises, they still don't really talk much about what they're doing. But just like I was saying a minute ago, in regards to uh, time frame. The enterprises that are looking at PaaS, they might even be running some internal production apps, but they're 
one, one not, talking not talking about it publicly, it publicly too much. much. They're, They're usually, usually involved intimately at a very, very hardcore level, level like, like in the actual email press, press or something like that, discussing the technical topics, topics but, not but not discussing exactly, exactly what they're doing, doing with it. Uh, there's, there's at least a half, half dozen, dozen, if not more, more companies out there that are doing everything from, you know, .NET, .NET to Java to, to different, different things. things. And, they and they have, have their, their own, own environments that they're setting up. And they're actually using it, but they're just, again, they're not talking about it. It's just kind of, yeah, we're using it, but it's in, a, it's in like a prototype stage, or it's, we just have one or two production type apps that it's okay, they don't need resiliency, so it's real safe for us to put them on there. And they're doing like a little bit of Greenfield stuff, but nothing really concrete, nothing that you could take and make like a use case story out of or anything yet. Yeah. Going, going back to Heroku, I've seen some really uh, important applications being run on force.com, but when it comes to Heroku, uh, most of the apps uh, I've come across are like a, more like a marketing kind of uh, apps or like start, uh, apps by startups. I haven't seen any core enterprise applications being built on top of Heroku, but uh, I've uh, seen such applications on top of force.com though. So, is it because, my question to you, uh, to you is, is it because people don't uh, trust posted uh, apps as like how enterprises are reacting towards the AWS listening, or do you see a thing different from what I'm saying? I, I don't think it's a, um, it's a differentiation between hosted and private. I think it's just that enterprises are slow to adopt, and in, in, in the same way that <coughs> you know, we haven't seen massive enterprise adoption of, of, of infrastructure as a service. That's not a, <coughs> you know, to an extent there's a private and public debate that will always go on. But it's, it's not fundamentally about public-private. It's, it's fundamentally about enterprises being slow to adapt and adopt. Well, and I think yeah. it's also they're holding their cards close to their chest. I mean, I, I deal with this in APIs as enterprise are emulating what's going on in open space. They're not telling the stories around it. And that's what I feel is my job is to route out these stories and incentivize them, um, not only tell the stories and tell the case studies, but also come up with some sort of you know, grading system or some sort of monitoring system. What is going on out there? What's working and what's not? You know? And it's really hard to do because they, they hold their cards so close. I think it has a lot to do with what you were talking about earlier as well, is that a lot of developers don't see the value. And maybe once they try it, like Adrian says, they'll, they'll see it. But I. I, I see a lot of people that think, well, I, I can spin up my machines with Chef or Puppet or whatever, and I don't really need to have somebody, you know, uh, babysit me and build this for me. I, you know, I've been setting this stuff up for years, so, you know, why stop now? Yeah. So, Aaron, you have been talking to developers. Kim, you are also talking to lots of developers. So, what do you think, I think developers prefer? They want to... They are uh, more happy with no upside of hosted paths or they are more into no upside of uh, private paths or even infrastructure and above kind of uh, approach. Uh, what is their preference? I, I think it totally depends on which group of developers I'm talking to. You know, you could classify that by a lot of different criteria. Um, but uh, like really young developers just getting into the field. You know, they need to jump in something, something like Ruby on Rails and Node. And, you know, as long as the pass handles what they need, they don't care anything else about behind there. But people that have a little bit of experience or, like, cut their teeth on some larger systems or whatnot, they're hesitant to give up any type of infrastructure control. Yeah, so they, they see it and they're like, okay, it's kind of cool, but I still want to be able to spool up some instances if I need to do something custom. And then, there's still a whole echelon of developers that are completely scared of cl anything cloud related at all still. So that's kind of the breakout that I've seen a lot. Okay. Right. Well, that's where I, I think uh, something like Amazon Elastic Beanstalk comes into play, where it's a, uh, they don't even call it a platform as a service, but it, it looks a lot like a platform as a service. And you can, uh, uh, to set up the uh, Java through it, you know, just with a, a click, but then uh, if you want to customize stuff, you can. You have the same, uh, you know, all the, the same ability to customize it that you would have uh, running just a normal um, AWS. But uh, uh, how, how is Elastic, uh, Elastic Beanstalk different from, let's say, 
me using Bitnami to install the package uh, uh, set of uh, using, using which Bitnami, Bitnami or one of the pack, uh, packaging uh, services and uh, push everything uh, pack uh, package everything I want push it to AWS or Rackspace or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, I think Elastic install the the Amazon should do more than Elastic install if they want uh, if they want to sort of. Yeah, if, they, if they want to do a pass play, they're going to have to do something more than just that. Because primarily all it's doing is automating, is automating the deployment, deployment process, process in a really elegant, elegant way for, for particular, particular framework stacks. stacks. Like, like they, they have, have .NET, .NET Java, Java and I think something else, I forget which one. But, uh, you know, outside of that, you're still completely on your own. Like if you do a node app at AWS, you still have to do your routing, you have to make sure your port numbers are, are routed appropriately, mm -hmm. you have to make sure you're managing your servers, your Apache, all this other stuff. I mean, it takes a considerable amount of time, um, generally a considerable amount of knowledge of networking and routing and stuff, just to make sure all those things are set up correctly based on whatever servers you use in, in conjunction with that. So you're talking about hours of effort. Whereas yeah. if you go into a lot of the other PaaS environments, like uh, the Cloud Foundry enabled ones, like a Tier 3 app fog or whatever, or you go to Windows Azure, you can, can have, have a Node app running literally in minutes versus the other situation. Yeah, yeah but that's, that's, that's partially to do with the, that AWS just doesn't support Node yet, really. right? That's or that, that, that Beanstalk doesn't, rather. But if you're, if you're doing Java, I mean, the, 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 the more direct comparison would be like what Podbees or, uh, right. and or, and or really actual net. Java passes. Yeah. And the, and the same thing with .NET, they added that just recently, and it's really smooth, really elegant. You can push it out to however many instances, takes a few minutes. Um, as long as you've used Visual Studio and the tooling, you, you're kind of set. But that's the thing. I mean, it's like they need to make that more of a, sort of, I, don't, I don't know how exactly to describe it, a parallel or synchronous type of uh, situation, because the Beanstalk is very different per framework the way it actually does it. I mean, the .NET one, for instance, uses web deploy, which is very, very proprietary to Microsoft environments, um, which is kind of giving you a two-way lock-in. You are definitely locked into the way Microsoft does deployments, and you're locked into then uh, the way AWS is doing your deployment. So the minute you become dependent on that, you're tied to that exact platform with that exact framework, with that exact deployment model. I mean, you have, you have one thing down the whole stack that you can touch on. You have very little flexibility at that point. Whereas the other ones are just kind of general, you know, oh, you can build a .NET app and use various deployment methods um, as long as you're using, say, Cloud Foundry or even, you know, whatever else out there. Uh, app Harbor also does it too, where it's just real clean. You can do a Git push or you do a VMC push and the application just deploys and then is automated into deployment there. It's just a very simple X copy. Um, doesn't tie in any deployment method or deployment style, whereas the Beanstalk usually ties you into those types of things. Okay. So, Ken, what, uh, what do you see? Uh, what do you see uh, while talking to the developers? Do you, do you see them uh, gravitating towards pass, or do you see them more happy with uh, uh, what Amazon is offering them? Well, um, I, you know, I don't... I, it's all about, you know, efficiencies. You know, for me, I mean, I guess that's that's kind of what you were just saying is, is the efficiency's got to be, efficiency's gain's got to be X. You know, I got to get like 10 amounts more efficient in what I'm doing so I look more like a rock star or I figure out what I'm doing. It's got to be in a language that I'm familiar with and I speak. So if I go into some of these environments and they don't speak my language, I'm not buying into that. Or if they don't have that, that install flow that I'm used to. Right. But, or if it's... I've got to learn a whole new way of doing things just to get this, and that efficiency is not there. So I'm not going to buy in. So that, I think that's why these 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 public versions, you know, tend to work better because I don't know. I guess you have to really get that efficiency gain before before you can go, you know, get credit, you know, some credibility in the public space. Otherwise, nobody's going to give a shit about what you're doing. So, um, you know, I, I, you just got to make developers' lives easier. And I think with the younger developers. It's like, it's like you said, you gotta, I gotta be able to come in. I just wanna, I wanna look like a rock star. I wanna be building what I'm doing. I wanna deploy what I do and, and get up and go on a show someone and be like, all right, here, I gotta win. And with the older developers, you gotta make them feel warm and fuzzy that they're, you're not yeah. getting them out of a job, but you're gaining efficiencies, but you can still see some of the nuts and bolts and how this goes together. Make them feel confident and it's more incremental. 
where I think we're going to be able to move faster with the younger crowd and get them going yeah. and, and push it. But it's always hinged to that older crowd who actually own, owns this infrastructure and is a little bit more responsible, I think, for it to a certain degree. Yeah, I see, I, see the, I see the generation gap too. At DeployCon, whenever I uh, spoke with uh, someone who is younger, like he is all excited about PaaS, and uh, whenever I talk to some, uh, some developer who is around 35 or more, uh, he is like, ah, no, PaaS is not going to work for it. That's the uh, uh, refrain I heard from those people. I think there's a big generation gap between uh, that is going to determine where we are headed in the future. When it comes mm -hmm. back to the storytelling, I think that's our role as all, all of us here are storytellers to a certain degree. And I know when I started, um, I started deploying uh, AWS, uh, EC2, you know, and, and S3 for SAP IT in Germany in 2008, 2009, and none of them would buy into it. And it took two years of me story, telling stories internally about my successes at, at running Sapphire and doing other things like that where I was like, look, here's what I actually deployed with it. Here's the story around it. Here's the efficiency gains. I was still able to do this. I was able to scale in this way and, and do it. And then now they're slowly evolving towards adopting the, the infrastructure as a service. So I think with PASS, it's just going to the story is going to be a lot more of these stories, but we just have to keep telling them. And when they're going on in enterprise, I don't know how to get them to do it. I don't know how to get them to open up their, their, their deck and show us. Tell us what's going on, but that's what's going to you know, be needed for adoption. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you. And uh, uh, you are the API evangelist. So, well, what is your take on interoperability in the past world? Well, I mean, I'm, my, my whole philosophy is, or my methodology, what I do is I go around and I look at uh, past, you know, public open past installations and look at how they deploy their APIs and set up set up the APIs and, and the building blocks around it so that developers are successful. So developers can step in and just immediately, you know, onboard within 30 seconds. So it's similar to deploying past infrastructure. If you want people to integrate with your infrastructure, you've got to have the right tools and the right systems. It's got to be self-service. It's got to have, have uh, you know, the different the mobile. It's got to have both Android and iOS. It's got to have some HTML5 or phone gap. So you got to have the right building blocks, otherwise developers walk away. So depending on whatever resources you're deploying in your past infrastructure, you've got to really know your target audience, I think, and you've got to assemble the right building blocks, otherwise developers don't care, and they'll go away. So Ben, Ben, uh, this is your first OSCON. So I, I'm sure you're talking to uh, more developers uh, in this conference than anywhere else. So what, what is the general feeling you're getting in terms of uh, Pass adoption or crowd adoption in general because it's an open source uh, crowd, it's a tough crowd. They're not going to take uh, crowd for what it is, they're going to dig deeper before they jump into cloud. So, what is the general opinion you're getting? Well, it feels to me like, um, like you say, I've never been to OSCON before. It feels to me like OSCON is, is really, really polarized. And that kind of speaks to the fact that the developer community is really, really polarized. And to, to, to points that we've heard earlier here, you know, in this this hangout, you know, there's um, a significant number of developers that often they're the younger developers that are keen to try something new. You know, they're delving into past, they're really getting it, and there's a bunch of folks um, that are dyed in the wool. You know, they they like doing things the way they've always done things, and you know, open source tends to um, attract people like that that are a little bit. Um, Dogmatic about what the way they do things, so I, w I would characterise it as being as as being really really polarised. And we can go out to the to the the halls here, and there's a bunch of people who don't know, don't care, don't rate um, the cloud or anything to do with it. You know, they've all heard Storman's rants about the fact that the cloud's the the riskiest thing since since I don't know what. Um, and there's other people that are that are here and getting it. It's it's pretty polarised. Um, so, Clint, uh, from uh, you, you have been uh, focusing on enterprise lately, and uh, I know you, you were writing for Wired Enterprise before you moved to TechCrunch. So, uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, will enterprise embrace cloud, public cloud, in, uh, in the next couple, uh, two, three years in a big way, or like that's going to be a very slow adoption? 
I think that, that Enterprise is already adopting public cloud, at least for uh, for infrastructure and and uh, and more so for uh, uh, software as a service. Um, I don't know about uh, platforms as a service, but. I, mean, I, I think the, the success of, of companies like Salesforce.com and, and Workday speaks to the, the fact that enterprises really are willing to to put stuff in the public cloud if they have the right <coughs> assurances. Yeah. So, Adam, uh, from uh, from where you are, like uh, you're you're doing some work with Tier Three, and uh, you you must be talking to some of the customers. So, what is your take on enterprise adoption? Hmm. The, the thing I see the most with PaaS is the internal deployments need cleaned up big time. The second that happens, this, the selling point to get PaaS put on the end of current enterprise internal custom applications is really easy. Uh, they might not see it as like this big, huge, awesome thing uh, that's going to save them a ton of time, but it will save them time and it will make it easier to manage and deploy applications. And in enterprises that have, you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of applications that they maintain, build, and deploy on a daily basis, then the past can be a huge, you know, efficiency and time saver. And in the end, on a day-to-day -day basis, it can save them a lot of time and money and effort. But, you know, it's, it's got to be easier to deploy into an enterprise environment because a lot of enterprises, they, they want one click or they want one, one script to run and they want it, you know, pretty pictures to see where all the pieces of the thing are because the fast environment is definitely going to be a, well, I'll just say an interestingly organic thing to manage. So they, once, once they have those pieces, we'll definitely see a lot more adoption of it. Okay. I, I think we have another 10 minutes before the Oram from Morph Labs is going to join. Uh, join us probably he'll come here at around 10.30. So uh, before that, I want to tackle the question of Microsoft and uh, PaaS. So where are they going? I, they started off well with PaaS. Now they are going towards uh, infrastructure service as a way to sort of counter Amazon. So where do you think they want to go in a few years from now? So I would like to give you one of you to talk about what do you think about Microsoft's strategy? It's Microsoft. They want to go everywhere. <laughs> So, so do you, uh, do you think uh, going, uh, uh, going down, uh, down the track of strategy call, it's a, uh, it's a realization that PaaS is not going for Microsoft? I don't know, you have any take on that? Yeah, um, I, I think when they jumped in, they kind of jumped in with a lot of assumptions around not just PaaS, but a way, the assumptions around what their developers knew. And I've seen a massive, massive, massive strategy change since the inception of their cloud. One of those strategy, strategy changes is a complete refocus on the polyglot nature of their cloud and going after startups, which is something that, you know, some startups you could talk to, they wouldn't even know Microsoft still made software. I mean, that's how disconnected Microsoft had gotten from new small business and, and startup culture. So they're fighting really, really hard to get back into that realm. And they're starting to make inroads with their involvement with Node and making it easier to deploy and supporting other, other things of that nature. But then they still, of course, want to go after the enterprise environments. And I think they're not as concerned. I think they would have liked to see more uh, acceptance of their cloud, and I think that's where they're getting a little bit more into the infrastructure bits, because they have they have a lot of communication, a lot of uh, you know things going on with enterprise partners already, and I think that's what's driving a lot of that that infrastructure need and, and some of those other pieces that they're starting to add, because they, they want to increase that that adoption, but it's it's slow going, just as we've all said, you know, the enterprise is usually the last to jump on board with a piece of technology. Okay, you are, a, you are a recovering .NET developer. So from your perspective, why did Microsoft have trouble attracting dot, their .NET developers to cloud? Because uh, at least I have spoken to some of the uh, startup or small business based uh, .NET developers. They didn't go to Microsoft for the cloud means they went to Amazon because Amazon was cheaper. 
Right. So it's the only reason uh, Microsoft is in the department or is there any other factor uh, you see affecting the uh, adoption? Yeah. Oh, one of the things that happened right off whenever they released Azure, for a lot of people, especially, you know, like all .NET community, the .NET devs that had already been playing around with cloud technology, they had to go out there and fight you know, to find anything to be able to deploy, you know, dotnet technology into the cloud. And they had done that, um, you know, there's AWS, like you pointed out, was, you know, hey, we have Windows servers, you can deploy stuff here. And when Azure first came out, if you did a side-by-side -side comparison, there was zero competition. It was easier to do something from the IaaS la layer of AWS than it was to attempt to do something from the platform level of Azure, and Azure was somewhat confusing, and you didn't get good feedback. It was just, it was really hard to trust it initially when the, the product came out. Whereas AWS, you could go there and you had all the traditional logging that you had on the instances, you could see what your applications were doing, and still today even, I mean, AWS can spool you up a machine as fast or faster than anybody else out there. So, you know, a lot of customers that were doing .NET, were doing Microsoft SAC products, were already doing it in an environment that was easier, even though Windows Azure was supposed to be. I think now the tables have flipped a bit, but, you know, two, three years ago, when they first started, you know, they released the Azure beta, and then they actually released it to market, et cetera, it was, it was really tough to, to use it. Well, I don't think Microsoft really gets this kind of new realm of developers, too. Uh, and having been, uh, you know, 96 to .NET 2.0, I was, I drank Kool-Aid. I was Microsoft, mm -hmm. I was SQL Server all the way up to 2010. And, um, but now I'm an open source, I'm an API. I, I love this open realm. And yeah. I don't think they get that, you know, going into the Azure community, going, I don't get the same amount of support building blocks of tools. I mean, I go into the Azure community, I can use APIs and I can programmatically deploy instances and storage. But in yeah. Amazon, I can monitor my bill with APIs. Yeah. I can use, I can, you know, I can do a lot more sophistication. And I just think, you know, Microsoft needs to change their perspective of how they support and treat developers. All the days they need to get an actual task description or a partner description and a little box. I'm like excited and I'm open about yeah. it. Yeah. I need an Excel service area that I can right. go have the tools, have the community, have the design um, to, to do what I'm doing. And yeah. I think they're, they're, they're expanding and having lots of options and getting into other languages and stuff, but they need to get the new graded developers. Yes. That's one of the spaces where I've seen a lot of their efforts because. Like with them stepping up and really being involved with Node and things like that, they're trying. They're trying to get it. But uh, why, why would a Node developer go to Microsoft instead of, uh, let's say, uh, Joint or uh, even uh, uh, Alpha or Tier 3? Why would they go to uh, Microsoft? Is there any specific reason? Uh, why would they? Yeah, why would, uh, why would they consider Microsoft as their platform instead of uh, going with the um, company which is really cool? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I think that they're probably just hoping to get .NET developers who want to experiment with Node and not lose not lose the developers they already have. I don't think that they really have a, a great shot at getting uh, new developers over the Azure with that stuff yet. I mean, yeah, no, another change, problem with Microsoft, uh, which I've been telling them, uh, yeah, because they want to embrace all those open source developers and. Uh, YouTube generation of developers. I have been telling that, uh, tell they probably, I think they developed Dragon sponsors of OSCON probably two, three years back. And uh, I have been telling them that there's no point in uh, spending money sponsoring OSCON. But instead, uh, you send your employees to OSCON, uh, make them available, when, uh, or may, yeah. make people bump into them uh, in the hallway. So that will get people more comfortable with Microsoft than anything. For example, yes, uh, AWS is doing, doing that later. Yesterday, I came across many of the Amazon employees in the, in the hallways. Uh, so, whereas Microsoft is not doing. So, that's why AWS is doing this game. I don't know, Microsoft is not uh, getting any, yeah, it's not going anywhere. That's, that's my take. Yeah. Yeah, uh, 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 you're having, uh, you're from Morflux, you want to come and join me?
Cool. So I'm, I'm going to step out, guys. I have to uh, okay. get on another call. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Everyone, yeah, welcome to the Hangout. I and uh, introduce yourself. Probably talk about your company, and then we'll get into it. Great. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Yoram Teller. Uh, I'm the VP of Corporate Development at Morph Labs. Uh, and we make a converged infrastructure solution based on OpenStack. So all the hardware and all the software necessary. Uh, and today, or rather two days ago, we just announced uh, our most compact and efficient solution yet. So everything in a two-year box. So we are bundling uh, hardware with OpenStack and uh, trying to compete with the UCS Correct. Yeah. So we use... Uh, we use um, OpenStack Nova, yeah. okay. um, and then uh, we use block storage from the center, okay. so ZFS. Okay. Uh, and we originally started as just a software provider, mm -hmm. but we realized cloud was much more of a systems problem. Mm -hmm. um, so we redesigned everything from the ground up, okay. so everything is actually powered by SSDs. Okay. So um, uh, let's talk about two, two aspects of your offering. One is like uh, efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you thinking the CS system up to the big ions over there? And, yeah, and, uh, and also the cost factor. Yeah. Like, uh, so if you can do something, say something. Say something. Sure. So um, the solution that we just came out with two days ago is called the NCloud Helix. Mm -hmm. um, so the SRP on that is $75,000. Uh, and that features 80 vCPU, all powered by SSDs, as well as 3 terabytes of storage. Okay. So so and uh, and if you were to compare it, um, it's actually, over a two-year time frame, uh, about 30% cheaper than AWS. So we're very big proponents of the same So you expect people to go from public cloud to private cloud once they are uh, uh, if their load is not uh, picking, uh, picking at the uh, regular intervals and the consistent, so you're all yeah, I think for you the for for enter cloud will be more efficient. Exactly. Yeah. For enterprise computing, I think there's a fairly uh, well understood um, baseline, right? And you're never really going to go very far below that. And, you know, essentially what we're doing is offering a real alternative to these project managers who are going into a shadow IT department mm -hmm. and just swiping their credit card and going to Amazon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with, with our solution, literally in a matter of days, they can have it sitting within their data center and they have, you know, everything uh, as they would expect. So, you know, the instant access, the scalability, mm -hmm. uh, but the difference is, you know, the quality of service and performance that you're getting is greatly increased. So, um, we're seeing boot times on our virtual machines in under eight seconds. Okay, which is pretty good. And I I I fully agree with the the quality of the service issue which mm -hmm. we are seeing in public clouds. But uh, there, there is a school of thought that argues that uh, you can work around those issues, quality of service, or failure, uh, new failures, or sure. uh, uh, data center failures mm -hmm. on the uh, software layer. So. Uh, well, do you think uh, there will be a big obstacle as more enterprises adopt, this, adopt the design for failure approach to their uh, app, uh, to uh, doing their apps? Do you think uh, they will do for public clouds or private uh, clouds? Or do you think sure. it's an uh, obstacle to your company? Yeah, no, I think when, I, when I'm talking about quality of service, I'm really talking about the noisy neighbor problem. Okay. So, you know, when I'm on an instance on Amazon, no matter how you architect your solution, there's going to be uh, and things to buy out that are available. That's just the way it's structured right now. Um, and that's, that's, that's no jab at Amazon. I think what they're doing is executing you know, extraordinarily well for what it is. But that being said, if you want to get a dedicated instance where you always have a guaranteed quality of service, that's really what we're trying to focus on. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm a full proponent of architecting your solution for failure and uh, redundancy, and I think that's that's also a component of quality of service. But what I'm talking about really is more on the performance games. Okay. So, uh, do you think uh, Amazon will try to sort of? Uh, yesterday they announced uh, some service, service based on solid state drives. And yeah. Do you think they will go towards uh, offering uh, solutions uh, targeting enterprises which offer better quality of service, comparable to what uh, they can get from uh, private cloud? And if Amazon starts doing that, they can go to any level to compete mm -hmm. on the pricing. So do you think there will be a problem going forward? I don't think that's their business. I mean, I think, you know, the SSD stuff that they launched was, was really interesting. And, and uh, I remember reading a blog post actually earlier this morning from Adrian Cockroft from Netflix mm -hmm. um, that talked about actually not only the performance gate but the cost savings. 
and that's also what we're seeing too. The increase in IOPS is exponential. Um, but really, they're not they're not the bogey that we're we're kind of going after. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think understand. I think the it's important. I, I take you know what we do as they've showed us the way, right? So we're taking the massive web scale companies, whether it's Amazon or Google or Facebook. They're not building clouds the way you know a V Block mm -hmm. or a FlexPod or any of these guys are doing. It. Mm -hmm. They're just they're doing it with open source and they're doing it with hyperscale hardware. And so we're taking that same model and introducing it and allowing enterprises who do have IP constraints, right? There is a place for the public cloud, but there is also a place for a private cloud. The way we think about this is dynamic infrastructure. Okay. So yeah, actually, like I wanted to get you to compare with the big guy, big guy in boxes out there. Yeah. But, uh, since you brought in Amazon comparison, I uh, we can go I sort of, yeah, yeah. When I went into that loop. So let's talk about uh, your flex pods and squeezes of the yeah. world, yeah. and uh, how how do you uh, how do you compare with them in terms of both performance and pricing? And um, if I'm an enterprise a IT guy looking, looking at all these solutions, mm -hmm. why would I pick uh, your solution over so, uh, something from uh, IBM or um, uh, Cisco sure. or any, any of those well-known established brands which won't get me fired? Sure. So can you give me a reason why I should pick you over other people? Okay. There's, there's so many softballs you just love for me. I, I got I to gotta just uh, decide which, which direction I want to go with. So, um, the reason that I think we're, we're a superior solution in a lot of ways is because we're architected from the ground up for cloud. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is um, we utilize the hyperscale hardware that I talked about in open source software like OpenSet. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what you're seeing oftentimes from something like a B-Block are very large blades and expensive SAMs, mm -hmm. which means they have a fixed capacity. They're very difficult to scale. Uh, it's a very complex network. So it's difficult to actually manage it, and you have a you know specialized skill set, mm -hmm. um, and then ultimately you have to use these hundred fifty thousand dollar EMC SANs, which leads to prices for VMs that are north of a thousand dollars for acquisition. So we totally get rid of that, and so what we allow you to do is start way smaller. Mm -hmm. So this is exponentially cheaper than what you're going to find anywhere on the market, um, and it allows you to have a very small footprint. And then from there you can actually grow. And so what's cool about this is it becomes a sale that's actually directly for the project managers. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go and you get OKs from your CIOs and change your entire strategy around cloud computing, okay. which is oftentimes what's happening with these much larger uh, block devices. OK. OK. So let's uh, take the discussion back to uh, where we were initially mm -hmm. about uh, open source in the, in the world of cloud computing. Where did you bet uh, your company on OpenStack in particular? Like, so mm -hmm. very specific. Apart from the fact that it's open source is well good and things like that. Like, uh, is there any specific reason, especially you are using NOAA, which yep. has been criticized as the most immature of all the components there are. Mm -hmm. uh, not all, compared to the storage component, NOAA is considered to be very immature. Mm -hmm. So what is your uh, uh, take on OpenStack in general, mm -hmm. the maturity of OpenStack uh, today, mm -hmm. and uh, any reason why you pick OpenStack as the platform of choice? Sure. Yeah. So we've actually been around for several years in the open cloud game. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I kind of, you know, we, we've been doing this for a while, to say the least. So when we started, uh, the only thing around was eucalyptus. Um, and, you know, with, with popsicle sticks and tape, uh, we made a function for our customers. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, the way uh, it was licensed was never really going to be as friendly as Apache 2. Okay. So that's a big thing, right? So, so, so you have your GPL licensing was like that. Problem. Right. So we, we, we actually tried to commit code back to eucalyptus. Mm -hmm and they rejected it. Okay. And I think a lot of people have that experience. And so I've always said that I think OpenStack, in a way, is, is a strange way, is actually a fork of eucalyptus. Because eucalyptus got it right with the EC2 compatibility um, and having that open cloud framework, but they just didn't allow people to contribute back in that way. Okay. Apparently, they're getting a lot better, but I think the, the boat might have sailed for them. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, is that OpenStack is much more than just you know, compute and storage. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a yeah, framework, it's right? Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's extensible and you can bring a lot of things into it. And in that way, it's really exciting because the community is so large and the rate of innovation. I mean, it's two years and what we're seeing is, is pretty stupendous. To answer your question specifically about Nova, um, you know, what we're doing is focusing on, on a specific size of deployment, right? Mm -hmm. So on the low end, we're looking at 80 vCPU um, and usually to around 500 vCPU. And so we haven't run into any trouble at all with Nova or Nova Scheduler. Oh, okay. So you are, you're talking about 
for some release or uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been working on top of Essex, and, and that was our first release. Okay. Uh, openly on OpenStack. Okay. So um, yeah, the, you you spoke about uh, Eucalyptus doing the Amazon EC2 compatibility, right? Mm -hmm. You are betting on OpenStack, uh, which I think is going in a totally opposite direction. They want to make their API the standard and not Amazon. So they, they do support EC2 API, but uh, uh, when it comes to the question of standardization, mm -hmm. they want to go with the OpenStack API, then Amazon EC2 API, which is in a way proprietary, and Amazon didn't even, uh, uh, is not even giving permission to any cloud platform that right. is focused on service provider side. So, uh, so what is your take on it? Do you, on the API was. On the API was, and especially on what, where we should standardize. I understand, uh, and this is me speaking, um, I understand the uh, perspective of the broader OpenStack community. Uh, I I think it would be smarter to just standardize on the EC2 API. Okay. I've I've heard the argument that you know um, you know if, if we're completely based on the EC2 API, then we can't innovate as fast as we want to. Mm -hmm. um, and I get that, but I think standardize standardization would ultimately lead. Um, to greater economies of scale, which is where I think OpenStack is going to be able to compete. But uh, if you have to standardize on an API, at mm -hmm. least you should, the least you'll expect is the, com the company responsible for that API to cooperate with the sure. uh, ecosystem. And that's, that's definitely an issue. I mean, I, I don't. It's, so it's, when it's Amazon is not doing that, like, uh, do you think it's worth getting, getting on uh, Amazon API and standardizing around it? And uh, later, one day, we don't know. Uh, it's a uh, legal minefield for for which we don't have a clear cut answer. Yeah. So it could uh, come back to hurt the two people who are raising it, and uh, especially if you look at the service provider uh, uh, side, Amazon could go 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 behind them for uh, probably like um, uh, for anything. Like they uh, they don't they have even trademark. They don't even allow I think uh, the use of the term Amazon. Yeah, web services API or EC2 API or something like that. So, so uh, 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 potentially, like if I'm a service provider, I'm even an enterprise uh, IT uh, executive who's deciding on on APIs. I'd be worried that if uh, some decision happens like, uh, on uh, no, API like this. I mean, I, I've heard that argument too, but I don't. From what I understand, I'm not a lawyer. You can't you can't copyright an API. Yeah, you can you can. But uh, the thing is, uh, the, that particular part is somewhat clear right now. Uh, there could be many other ways in which Amazon, if Amazon decides to go behind somebody, they could. Uh, yeah. When they are not openly saying, okay, and it wouldn't uh, be anything in that Creative Commons license or something like that. So I don't think it would be in their best interest to do that. Though. I mean. So you, you, you expect the market to sort of uh, keep yeah. Amazon on the harness or something? Like that. I mean, okay. the, 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 the pushback that they would get would be pretty tremendous. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I can see arguments for both. Okay. So like, uh, what about uh, CloudStack? Which, uh, I, I think CloudStack was not an open source project uh, when you started. Now that it's part of Apache Foundation, mm -hmm. how do you see CloudStack versus OpenStack in terms of maturity? And do you think uh, you also see an opportunity Waiting on clothes track uh, in the future. So we we bet the entire farm on OpenStack. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think CloudStack is interesting. Um, you know, Citrix has a strong team. I think timing-wise, it was probably a little bit late on their end. And ultimately, you know, what wins these these wars is an ecosystem. And the ecosystem that's behind OpenStack is second to none. Yeah, um, and that's, really well yeah I mean, it's 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 just it's. It sucks for them, but it's hard. It's really hard to combat that. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously they have a little bit of a head start um, in terms of their deployments, but it's it's very simple what they're doing. And I think, you know, go to go back to OpenStack's strength. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more than just a compute, right? You know, it's yeah. a larger. It's framework. a larger framework, and soon it will be, be the cloud OS of choice. Yeah. yeah. And I think it just promises so much more flexibility and extensibility that is harder for a lot of these other open clouds. Um, initiatives to complete. Okay. okay. So uh, let's uh, briefly talk about uh, OpenStack Foundation. Are you part of? Uh, are you a sponsor of OpenStack Foundation? We are. We are. So uh, we are a gold member of the OpenStack Foundation. Okay. Um, we really uh, tried to be joining from from the start. Okay. So um, what, what, what do you think of the controversy that uh, erupted uh, where uh, uh, Joshua was arguing that? Uh, 
the kind of tiered uh, structure sort of helps bigger companies who are in the platinum sponsor range to sort of take advantage because they get more votes in the board. So, what do you think of this controversy? So, do you are you do you think that's uh, that's a new controversy? So, um, or do you think that, that uh, they are sort I'm of trying to think about how to answer this as politically as possible? Okay. Right? <laughs> um, I don't I don't want to say anything. Yeah, about I understand. Josh. Uh, so, I think I think uh, the OpenStack committee and the foundation board has done a really good job of making it really transparent mm -hmm. with how they're constructing the bylaws um, and. There, I mean, I don't know if you saw yesterday, but now individuals yeah, can sign up uh, directly for OpenStack, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's it's an open source community, and we're something that we're starting from, from the beginning. And I, and to me, the controversy or, or to raise these points is important mm -hmm. because I, I don't I don't view OpenStack. So yesterday was the two year anniversary, right? I think there's another 20 years in this. I really do. I think this is a large paradigm shift, and it's important to talk about all these points and make sure that we're doing this right. Okay, let's uh, sort of move away from the, the point Josh uh, raised, and uh, let's uh, take uh, Moth Labs as a gold coast sponsor, and IBM as a platinum sponsor. In a way, you both are going to compete at uh, some point. Are you worried that IBM, with that kind of a power, could uh, drive the uh, project in a direction which could be detrimental to Moth Labs? So, truthfully, um, just so you know, there, the the way it shook out for the, the platinum versus the gold sponsors, it actually ended up being probably better to be a gold sponsor in a, in a sense, okay. because the platinum sponsor is guaranteed a board seat. Mm -hmm. um, so there's eight of them, I believe, and I think there's 11 gold members, mm -hmm. and there has to be as many board seats coming from gold as platinum. And so it's just as likely that somebody from IBM or somebody who's a gold sponsor, so they're almost as likely to get a board seat equally. And at that point, um, you know, there, there's some uh, fail safe and the, the order is big enough where I don't think one company can exert its force. You know, it's 24 people. It's mm -hmm. pretty large. So going forward, what is the future for uh, Moth Labs? And uh, mm -hmm. if you can get, uh, talk, uh, talk a little bit about the roadmap and things like that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, when we, I, I think a lot about this stuff in terms of these, the large soul of the company. And what we always try to do is drive efficient computing. Um, and what I think this means is not only in our architecture, um, but in the delivery mechanism. So keep making the footprint smaller, making it easier for people to deploy. I mean, the experience right now for, for our customers is literally, you know, this 2U box arrives with four nodes, they plug it in and work. That's really important. Um, I want to keep making IOPS higher. And then ultimately, what we're known for is our UI. So we don't use Stock Horizon. Mm -hmm. uh, we built our own UI that actually extends the Fog API, so mm -hmm. to a Ruby app. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, what you're going to be seeing from us in the next quarter is the ability to uh, expand out into other public clouds um, and that kind of thing okay. directly from our interface. So um, really in, into that realm of being able to buy your, buy, buy your base and rent your spike. Mm -hmm. um, and this idea of dynamic infrastructure services. So um, you know, the kind of private cloud and post private cloud of what you expect from the public cloud. Okay. Um, so so yeah. Ben, are you have any questions? I'm not just my only question. So the, the new thing that you announced here um, is, is kind of Aim for. Can you talk up? Uh, uh, muted, yes. Yeah, so yeah. Oh, I'm muted. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> is, is aimed for, for SMB customers. Mm -hmm. And so I guess um, private cloud. Um, I would say SME, by the way. What's that? SME. Right. So smaller, medium sized enterprise. Sure. Okay. Um, we say SME down where I'm from as well. Yeah. So I, I guess a lot of the feeling, a lot of the perception is that private cloud has validity for the larger enterprises who already have um, existing assets, existing infrastructure and have kind of mm -hmm. use cases that, that yeah. demand it. Interested to hear your um, your take on, on where the validity for private is for, for smaller smaller folks? Yeah. No, I think um, it's it's definitely a really good point. So. You know, if I was a startup right now, uh, what I what I would be focusing on is just actually deploying on a public cloud. I think that's really what makes a lot of sense. The reality is, is there's a lot of um, enterprises that already have massive infrastructures, um, and they already have IP constraints. Um, and so, what's happening, uh, and and not to the benefit of their own IT staff, is they're actually going out 
and just provisioning um, this public cloud infrastructure on their credit cards. And so I think it's important to be able to provide an alternative to these SMEs. Um, and, you know, there's there's a lot of things that they, they are looking for. I mean, um, the truth is, is, even when you go onto a public cloud, um, you're still going to need, uh, you know, system administrators to be able to architect these solutions for you. Um, and I think if you're running a data center as is, uh, you know, from what I've seen, this is ends up being actually cheaper over a two to three year time frame, considerably, um, which is ultimately very important to um, a lot of these guys. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, kind of. I, I guess I'm, uh, I'm speaking more in relation to, to the product that you, you launched. And so, I mean, I, mean, I guess, what's the customer demand for, for that? For, you know, what, what sort of organizations, what sort of SMEs? Oh, what, oh, what kinds? Oh, okay, sorry. So I think we focus on specific workloads for what we're doing. Um, and when I say SMEs, it's, it's actually a distinction from, you know, very large enterprises who are doing, let's say, you know, 1,000 core plus. So SMEs actually end up being pretty large. Um, we focus on a couple. So uh, rapidly deployable websites, um, build and test with IP constraints. Um, there's been SaaS providers who have actually wanted to take their software, put it on, and then deploy it within customer data centers, so usually like a healthcare application. Um, and generally what we've actually seen is also uh, server consolidation is a big one. Um, and uh, several others that I'm blanking on. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. So uh, one last question I have is, in general, uh, do you see large-scale adoption of OpenStack and enterprise, not just from uh, through Mark, Mark, but in general, what does it take, uh, take on enterprise adoption of OpenStack? I think enterprise adoption has already been pretty rapid. Okay. Um, I think you know, they're not used to telling their stories as much naturally mm -hmm. just because that's not what enterprises typically do. Um, I think service <coughs> providers, uh, it's probably, probably been the one place that OpenStack's been lagging a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but they're starting to catch up and, you know, we announced a pretty large one mm -hmm. this week, so Media Temple, mm -hmm. um, which I think you both are familiar with, uh, is going to be launching a host of private cloud service based on uh, the mCloud Helix, okay. which is pretty cool. Okay. Um, so it's going to be hosted by a private cloud. It's not going to be that public cloud. Service. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's that's you know that's something that we didn't talk as much about when we were talking about the Amazon thing, right? But what's also really exciting to me about OpenStack is the uh, ability for the ecosystem to flourish, mm -hmm. right? So in a way, Amazon has really kind of made their choice as to what you know infrastructure, the way they see public cloud, mm -hmm. and it doesn't always have to just be like that, right? There could be other choices. You can have a private cloud that's you know more performance oriented, more mm -hmm. security oriented, and that's that's the kind of beauty of it too, right? So service providers compete on mm -hmm. on really different verticals and different facets, yeah. as opposed to just scale and price. So do you see any traction on the high-performance computing side? Oh, yes. Thank you. That's the biggest one. That's the, the workload that I... Okay. So this will be... Yeah, so, so that's... So since we're running all on SSDs, um, what, I, what I think about is HPC is kind of um, programmatic access to workloads. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been working with um, kind of an HPC in animation okay. in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what they've been able to do is bring up a virtual machine, uh, run the workload, and kill it all within 40 seconds. Oh, okay. so wow. it's, that's cool. Yeah, it's cool. Mm -hmm. And that's all from, from the way that we use SSDs, right? Okay. So having your compute infrastructure all run, all run on SSDs increases your IOPS, you know, 10 to 20x. And this is something that you're just not going to find um, from these larger converged infrastructure yeah. vendors, right? Yeah. Because they they need to push these large ba blades and expensive sands, and mm -hmm. because that's 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 the way they think about their business, right? Yeah. And also, the, this sort of comes handy for uh, HPC work that's happening in academic institutions. Oh, it's they huge, don't have yeah. to waste uh, publicly funded taxpayer money on yeah. such large, uh, uh, big iron masses. Yeah. And they could go with uh, open source and. Uh, much cheaper uh, thing, yeah. and they could uh, do much uh, much better than. Uh, yeah. So at OzCon, I've actually had a couple of really great conversations. Some of my favorite conversations have been with education. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, these, they have a lot of pressures financially, and they got to try to figure it out. So you know, when you have constrained budgets, 
and you don't necessarily have a budget to find you know two hundred and fifty thousand dollar cloud architects minimum, mm -hmm. um, and then you have to fiddle around for six months trying to get the hardware yeah. uh, and yeah. configure it. Yeah. So this of time, this of money, and uh, it doesn't work. Right? Yeah. yeah, so I think that's that's where we can really we really fit in very well. So something that's a small footprint, easy to get started, and it's it's kind of this panacea for, for what they need to be doing. Is there anything else you want to add uh, before we wind up? Uh, really love the blog. It's a great blog. Okay, thank and you. I love uh, diversity.net, .co, .nz. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, no, I really enjoyed this. Uh, and uh, thank you guys for having me. And, uh, thanks for coming over, and it was fun talking to you. Yeah. I'm and sure. let's uh, keep the conversation going. Please. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. If we don't see you anywhere, I think I'll see you at San Diego. Yes, you will. Yeah. You will definitely. And I'll be at VMworld, too. Oh, okay. So we'll have a big announcement at VMworld. Oh, so okay. You there. Sure. there you go. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks, man.